Good morning, everyone. I'm honored to be with you as a speaker at Nigeria 2.0. Thank you so much, organizers, for inviting me. And since we don't have much, much time, let's get right into it. My name is Isma Ney. I'm from Tunisia, North Africa, and I'm a machine learning consultant working with Orange Tunisia, uh, a teacher, a Google developer expert in machine learning, and last but not least, a tech mentor at the Google for Startup Accelerator. Now, as I work a, a lot with startups, I started find, finding out some issues that were not uh, clear enough when I used to just do engineering. And these issues came with deploying the uh, machine learning solutions into production. Now, let me explain. As you already know by now, AI and machine learning is everywhere and dominating. Be it in medicine, in games, finance, automotive, agriculture, AI is getting more and more into our world and is getting uh, more mature as time passes and more domains are getting impacted by it. And while all of this is good, um, there are some times where AI can go horribly wrong. Now, some examples happened, for example, with Uber in March 18, 2018, where the self-driving car hit a bicycle because it didn't see the, the, uh, the cyclists. And also, uh, in October 2018, Amazon might want to make an AI recruiter, but found out that it was discriminating against women. And last but not least, uh, a Chinese smart traffic camera in May 2019 mistook someone scratching his face for, uh, for talking on the phone while driving. Now, while AI does impeccable things, one might ask how and why did it make so, so, such stupid decisions? Well, the thing is, uh, uh, the, the answer lies within the way that machine learning works. Now, as you already might know, machine learning works different from traditional programming. Let's say that you want to make a, a security camera that can capture if Spider-Man has been in the room. So, if we wanted to work this the traditional way, we would look at Spider-Man and try to find out what are the features that make Spider-Man. For example, this is Spider-Man because he has a mask, it's red and blue, has white eyes, no hair, and spider logo. And you could make a program that can use these features as ways to determ determine if Spider-Man has been here or not. But then what if Spider-Man changes costume or posture? Well, that will not work. So the way that we solve this is by using machine learning, because machine learning doesn't, is not based on features. It's based on data and many, many, many um, uh, examples of data. So we would give it many pictures and say, this is a picture of Spider-Man, this is not a picture of Spider-Man, and the machine learning, uh, the, the AI will learn the features that make out Spider-Man so that it can detect it even if the lighting is not good, even if there are changes to the costume, changes to the posture, etc., etc. And the more data that you give him, of course, the better the AI will be because it will be able to be better distinguish the features that make Spider-Man. Now, the thing is, um, this automatic pattern recognition is what made machine learning so good and it made it able to beat outperformed uh, doctors in their, uh, in their specialty even with, with the user experience. And also that made um, autonomous vehicles so efficient. But it's also the same reason why Amazon's AI recruiter discriminated against women and the same reason why the driver got a, a ticket for scratching the face uh, or for something like this. It's because the automatic part means that we do not know what it's learning, and that's the big problem. That's the big problem. Now, let's take a, a let's take an example to see why this is an issue and how it works. Suppose we make, want to make a classifier of dogs versus wolves. We would give a thousand pictures of each class: a thousand pictures of wolves, a thousand pictures of dogs, and suppose that you manage to get an F1 score of 80%, which is decent. Now we want to test on these two pictures and we get wolf for the one on the top and dog for the one on the bottom, which is wrong. Now, we are data scientists, so we are not satisfied. What we, go, what we do is we go choose different metrics, perform data augmentation, pre-processing, different architectures, high parameter, data splits, etc. And yet we still don't get satisfactory results. Now, this is where interpretability or explainability can come in. Um, as you know, machine, deep learning models are black boxes, meaning that we know they perform good, but we don't know why they do perform uh, that, good, that well or that, uh, that bad. 
and interpretability explainability aims to uncover and discover what's happening inside the black box to help us get uh, do uh, better uh, corrections in machine learning it used to be very easy with decision trees you had to see the information gain uh, with SVMs and parallel, we just had to, to take a look or to plot the, the, the functions, the lines, and with Kynet, it was even easier with that. Um, uh, but then there are limitations to machine learning. As we go into more complex uh, data sets and more complex ta uh, tasks, we see that machine learning has limitations. And that's why we turn to deep neural networks or deep learning because of the improved results. However, by doing that, we also have no clue what's happening inside the hidden layers because we cannot single out the features and we don't know exactly why this or that happened as everything is uh, tangled together. Now, we lost, so we had to sacrifice, um, uh, we had to sacrifice uh, explainability for performance. However, this might cause many problems, especially in uh, domains like the military, in medical, cybersecurity, and finance. As sometimes due to rules, we have to say why we did this or that action, and we have to also um, explain the results, explain why the model did that, because we have to report in afterwards. So in these cases, interpretability and explainability is of utmost importance. Now, you might say, all right, this, so that's why explainability is important, but what can we do? Well, there are many, many techniques. There are techniques also specific for uh, each uh, field. For example, for computer vision, we have occlusion sensitivity, saliency maps, class activation maps, grad cam, etc., etc. For tabular data, we can explore the weights using feature importances from the trees, random forests, etc. And then we have model agnostic uh, techniques like Lime and Chap. But I will let you look at this uh, on your own because we don't have much time. Let's take a small example with the occlusion sensitivity to uh, apply, and we will apply this on our uh, dog versus wolf's problem to see how it can help. Now, as you remember, we had wolf on the top and dog on the bottom. And let's say we took the uh, confidence scores. We have 80% and 83%, so it's very confident. What you're gonna do is, we're gonna make a lot of copies of this uh, example and for each copy, we're going to add a small box on the picture. It's noise. So we're going to just manipulate the photo to make this uh, small box. And we're going to make a lot of copies of that box. And each time we're going to move the box around and see the confidence scores. The goal being uh, to try and make as many as possible and, and um, compare how the confidence scores um, fluctuated between the boxes. Well, once we have that, we can then merge them into one map where the, uh, the part in red are the highest uh, importance pixels while the ones in blue are not high, meaning that the more red it is, the more it has impacted the decision. And as you can see, the actual animals are in blue, so they did not have an importance. However, it was the background that is very important. So what this means is that our model is actually classifying the backgrounds and not the animals. And this is actually very, if you go back and look at it, it's actually logical. As you can see, the pictures on the top for the dogs in the training set all had a green background with grass, while the wolves all had snow and white uh, backgrounds. And so when we gave it a, a dog with, a, uh, with snow background, it, it saw it as a wolf and vice versa for the dog. So in our case, the problem was that there was bias in the data set that you did not uh, observe ourselves which is uh, present in the background and bias in machine learning or deep learning is one of the biggest problems in uh, in real life um and in, 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 it's one of the biggest problems when you deploy your your apps in reality because it's um because it's patterns that we do not see and that can be very dangerous like for example in amazon ai recruiter there were patterns where the male candidates had some things in common other than the gender in itself so even though they remember they removed the gender attribute there were some patterns that only males took that impacted the decision of the ai same thing for the chinese smart traffic camera it may be that they only took pictures from a certain distance where it's not really visible, the, uh, the phone. That's why uh, it mistake it for this. Or uh, the dataset might, really, uh, might be really tricky to, to, to work with, for example, like this one. So all of this makes it so that there is, um, there is a bias 
so that there is unwanted racism so that there is a bias and it's sometimes very hard to, 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 to see and to find it's not that easy now let's see what let's see lime which is one of the most popular techniques now alongside with sharp but I'm gonna start with lime because it's easier to explain in just four minutes now with lime from the paper why should I trust you which explain the prediction of any classifier it is we are going to take a picture and we are going to ask it to, uh, to see, hey, where is the Labrador or why is it a Labrador? What Lime will do, it will do a series of perturbations. It will perturb the picture with noise. Uh, as you can see, it will, for example, randomly uh, uh, blacken out parts of the picture. And then we will ask it, why is this a Labrador? It will give us the uh, pixels that were important in our case, because even with the perturbations, it managed to find that that's a Labrador. How it does this is by taking the picture, which is the global picture, which is a complex nonlinear uh, solution because we have like um, the object in itself is uh, represented by some pixels and it's not always a square. And what it does is it, it zooms in into the global picture and tries to make many, 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 many small local simple linear classifiers. So it divides the big picture into very small pictures that are very simple and linear uh, classifiers and then it will merge all of these to see where the, uh, the class number one starts and where it ends. So if you take for example an original image of, the, uh, of this frog and the heart and we ask hey where's the, where's the frog? So we get, for example, those three perturbed instances. So we have three perturbations. And then we can calculate the probability of a tree frog by doing a classification on the uh, borders of those uh, pictures and see where, a, a, uh, where the classifier ends and where the class um, starts. And this is uh, all done by, as you can see on the, on the top right, locally weighted regression. So basically we take the, just that part of the pixels and try to classify that part of the pixel. And then we try to merge all the results together to see an explanation. So in this case, once we took the three perturbated instances and then we merged the results, we found that the biggest parts were on the top and not on the, uh, on the, in the middle. And that's why an explanation it told us that the, the top part, which is the head, is the biggest part that says that that's a tree frog. Because the middle part gave us a 0 0.0001, meaning that it's not, not, nothing there. We had the highest score on the top and a, high, and a low score in the middle, in the, in, the, in the bottom, even though not much of the picture was perturbated, meaning that that top part is very important. So when you merge this on hundreds of perturbations, you get something like the explanation on the right. Now, this is an example, another example, this is a, a bad example. This is what we talked about in the uh, background classifier. So, husky classified as a wolf. Why? This explanation is because of the snow behind the, uh, the husky. And this is interesting even on multi-class. So for example, in the origin image, we have three classes. We have the electric guitar, we have, uh, we have the, uh, the Labrador, we have the uh, guitar, and then we have an acoustic guitar. And then we can uh, explain each object uh, by itself for saying, hey, why is it an electric guitar? Why do you think there are a 0.3 percentage that it's a electric, uh, 0.3 probability that's a electric guitar? Well, that's why. Why it's acoustic? Well. Uh, th that's why and why it's a laboratory why well that's why so it's not always perfect but it does good they will give us a good 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 job especially that it's a, a, a model agnostic one so it works on any any classifier um, and the better the model is well the better it will be but the thing is by doing those small scale perturbations many times and merging the results we get an overall feel of what makes it so that this, this what makes it so that this uh, uh, model has classified this, uh, cla this picture or this picture that way or that way. Now, you could check it out yourself on GitHub uh, in the Lime uh, Git uh, repo repository of why should I trust you. Um, and the good thing is that it doesn't only work on images. Uh, as I said, it works on any classifier. It could be text, multi-class, binary images, etc. And it's very easy to, uh, to uh, put into in place. And so uh, just one last part, uh, why interpretation is more important than you think? Well, it helps you choose between multiple high achieving models. So even though you get many uh, good results, well, this one can help you out if you uh, can check out the, the, the reason why it gives you so many results. So it could be that three good models, they have three good models, but they were uh, classifying the wrong thing. It gives you a way to explain to clients why it came to that conclusion, 
way to, uh, uh, to optimize your model better and faster and to know what data to collect uh, so that you can um, so that you don't fall into the bias trap and especially you don't put people's lives at risk so with this an honorable mention would be Elich explaining Kalam 5 which is also a very simple way to explain the decisions of your model it's uh, it's easily integra integratable into any uh, work line and uh, into any uh, uh, workflow be it scikit-learn, Keras, XGBoost, etc and with this, I do have, uh, and with this, I do hope uh, that I give you a good, uh, a good overview of machine learning and predictability and explainability. We only had 15 minutes, so I had to kind of make it very quick. But I do hope that I at least managed to give you a feel on the importance of it. So with this, thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the event.